and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. Amen. Hey, a a man of a man of many a man of many talents. The one of them being the head honcho of Flagbearer Games, creators of the most the most patriotic hack of D and D fifth edition that you can possibly do, and one that I may run every every July fourth, like I like I play my favorite movie on July fourth. No, it is not Independence Day. You all should know me better than that. Ah, uh, but. It, the game, the game, of course, being nation, being nations and cannons, and a game, and a game where I can say, "And may my wife refuse my bed if I can't deliver to your head the resolution on independence." Pat Luke Mooney, how you doing today, man? Um, you got a remarkable singing voice right there. Uh, <laughs> let, let me tell you, um, I, I, I better, I hope it's the Patriot, right? Is that the one we're talking about here? No, I meant I mentioned I mentioned seventeen seventy six. Although I've I've used the Patriot in a few in a few memes. Um, one one of the one of them be one of them being ev being every time I see the Yankees get their ass kicked in baseball. <laughs> because because and anytime anytime I get to give a middle finger to New York is a good day for me. Uh, ouch. Um, uh, I, I, as a, as a New Jersey, uh, resident, uh, I, I agree. Um, but, uh, as someone who works in Manhattan, um, or did, uh, when working in places was a thing, um, mm, a bit of a surrogate home. Uh, so the, so the weird thing about the Patriot, right, is that it gets, it gets a bad rep by historians quite a bit. Um, and deservedly so, right? There are lots of uh places where it glosses over the bits of history where it combines aspects from different figures together into one uh where it sort of abridges uh, or jumps the gap in sort of the timetable in order to tell a more compelling story which is kind of standard hollywood stuff right and and particularly i'd say, I'd say it's standard storytelling stuff it's one um i've i've had i've had my back and forths with historians and um one thing, one thing that I've crit one thing that I've been very critical with, um, with pe with people dis with people discussing, um, the historical accuracy of of say of, of say a film, a book, or what have you is, a lot of them do not know how to pick their battles. <laughs> yep, you gotta you gotta you gotta focus on. There, there is a difference between uh, a dogged reliance on historical facts and like a, a a real attempt at verisimilitude which is what i think the patriot got right you know i mean it did have its mustache twirling like you know a sinister serial killer british officer and it absolutely glossed over the relationships uh between the white planter family and their slaves that totally weren't slaves that were paid because that was absolutely a thing that happened in the south at that point in time mm -hmm. um but for the rest of it and for the attempt to portray the style of warfare that uh happened you know that that uh guerrilla fighters would use the ability of uh it, you know, a, a handful of individuals to kind of cause a ruckus and 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 really disrupt the uh, redcoat supply lines, and really what the sort of political situation on the ground was, the kind of the tenuous back and forth, and the relationships between um, ardent patriots, uh, neutrals who really made up uh, a third or more of the people on the ground at the time, um, and you know the, your loyalists uh, who you know fought for for king and country. Um, I think. It did a good job at modeling those types of stories, um, and that is something that Nations and Canons has borrowed from a little bit, um, mm -hmm. maybe with a, a, a bit more of an eye to historical detail. Yeah, the, um, the the big reason the big reason that I s and the, there's a couple there's a couple things to note when I say that a lot of his a lot of historians um, don't know what don't know when don't know um, how to pick their battles. Um, 
first, I, I, of, I often see I often see a fair amount of historians and fair amount of people who do do these kind of accuracy checks, um, like call call this kind of thing Hollywood call it this kind of thing Hollywoodization or some derivative of that of that term. And for me personally, I, I have to just sit back and go. And you think bards didn't embellish five hundred years ago? Story to story, embe story embellishment is not new. Espe especially, especially if you, especially if you look at, say, oral traditions from from the distant past. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I, I, I know it well. Um, yeah, it's and there's also like what makes a folk hero like what is a folk tale right a folk tale is the embodiment of a particular archetype or a type of story you know um and what it means for a community um and it it's larger than life it takes a hero and kind of you know puts them uh you know on the shoulders of a giant and and lets them loose uh, and and tall tales were very much a part of you know the sort of uh, the way that uh, information was exchanged, particularly on the frontier of, of colonial America. But, um, you know, there, there is a kernel of truth in them as to, you know, the types of characters they speak to um, were emblematic. They were the iconic, uh, you know, stories of their day. And, and so that's sort of, you know, one of the things that we've done um, in our historical research. Um, so we, we've created a system uh, in... Fifth edition, I, I should give, I guess, a little bit of the spiel, right? But like, you know, we've created a uh, a campaign setting for playing historical adventures in uh, the fifth edition of. Can I say it? Uh, the the world's most popular role playing game. No, um, no. Hey, hang on, hang on. It, it, we, I'm I'm gonna keep it. Um, in it, I'm gonna go as close as it comes to keeping it Wakandan in here. We don't do that here. We <laughs> okay. We are not. We are not. We are not legal. We are not legally obliged to use the right to use the right words, the right language, or anything like that. We are in the monastery. We don't give a fuck. All right. All right. I you know, I, I just got, got done. You know, writing up the the very detailed OGL copyright page. So forgive me if I'm uh, a little uh, skittish about name drops here. But um. So yeah. So it's it's a. Uh, campaign setting for uh, 5e D&D &D mm -hmm. that um, is is built around allowing you to play with all the toys uh, that you would have in the 18th century um, in a completely uh, mundane world um, and finding ways that you, we can replace things like spell casting um, or like some of the uh, really extraordinary abilities that make sense in a fantastical setting um, with these with similar kind of larger than life um aspects that um hew to themes from the 18th century but you know uh are also still grounded in in uh in history grounded in in you know sort of the the factual evidence and and uh particularly you know uh the technology that was available at the time because the age of enlightenment had so much you know development um in in the sciences in uh, you know uh, the concept of uh, liberty and rational thought, right? Um, where there's there's lots of interesting ways you can play around with things like that and adapt them to the framework of of five E's mechanics. That's what we've we've really tried to do. Now, with that with that in, with that in mind, to kind of to kind of rewind to kind of rewind a little bit, um, I'd like to go. I'd like to delve a little bit into the humble beginnings. So. Sure. I'd like what I'd like you to do is walk me through your fr your um, first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? <laughs> oh boy! Okay, all right. So now now we're we're working all the way back. Um, I like uh, many, I'm sure, um, was that kid who bought you know the player's handbook, uh, but didn't have any friends to run it with, and just spent hours and hours and hours, you know, in middle school, like lovingly turning those pages until they got all wrinkled and uh and creased up you didn't have any I, had, I had friends um i didn't not have friends but i didn't necessarily have like the right group of nerdy friends and i also oh, yeah. wasn't like confident enough to like be the game master to step up and say i'm gonna run this you know follow me off into into the the wilderness well you should have kept up on the payments then <laughs> 
Um, yeah, well, that, you know, uh, that, 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 that was a bit harsh. <laughs> uh, I was too busy getting uh, uh, getting my lunch money uh, taken against landed lockers um, and fi- fulfilling every uh, possible nerdy cliche. I, uh, um, I did. I did. I ended, in, rob- in... I ended up robbing the bullies. What do you? So I have that, I got that going for me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, not all of us can break the norm. Um, I did wind up uh, playing a little bit of uh, AD and D in high school. Um, just just uh, you know, uh, uh, scrap here and there. Um, but it really wasn't until uh, undergrad that uh, I got my feet wet. And of all things, that was with the Star Wars Saga Edition. Uh, role-playing game which uh, is a sort of the redneck stepchild of d20 modern and uh 3.5 uh it not sort ex- of not ex- not exactly well oh. well the, the second part uh, uh of of what i was about to say is that it it does prefigure fourth edition in a lot of interesting ways so yes it, it does. yes it does it, it it served as kind of a test bed for a lot of really cool experimental ideas many of which were subsequently completely scrapped um and unbalanced as all heck right like there was there there was a very small team working on it um i i gather and uh, they had a, a tight deadline to hit as far as getting the you know getting these books to the printers and sending them off but there are a lot of really neat ideas in there um and i as a first time gm had no idea what to make of them so my players ran roughshod all over the first couple of years uh, of of my campaigns but we had a lot of fun with it yeah when when it comes to i've um i've def- i've i haven't get now when it i think um i think when it comes to saga edition it already had a cloud against it because of the fact that the last time that they tried to adapt um, Star Wars to D20, it was revised, and that went over like like a fart in church. <laughs> How can we take 3.0 and make it even worse? <laughs> to be to be fair, um, it came out it came out like a I think about a year and a half after after the 3.0 books came out, and. A lot of people's interpretation of third edition is largely what happened in 3.5. 3.0 was a mess, <laughs> especially for some cl- for some classes more than others. Like say the sorcerer, um, um, right, ra- and ra- Well, the ranger has always been sn- has always been snake bit, so I can't really use that. And, it- and um, time has not been kind to that class. <laughs> but- oh, the poor ranger. The poor the ranger the ranger is probably the most snake bit class in um fifth edition right now, c- given that they've so, tried to, they've tried to fix the thing three times in the last yeah it, years. it's separate sort of like pseudo patches rolled out in the different books and we, we definitely went into the ranger subclass the trailblazer that we yeah. uh built um yeah, which, uh we, like we, we'll, yeah we'll get, we'll we, we over tuned it a little bit uh was the intention because the the base class has has a couple of issues and so we decided to just jack the power level up uh, ever so slightly comparative mm-hmm. to a couple other subclasses yeah um but with that but um with that ki- with that kind of thing in mi- with that kind of thing in mind um how were you were you always a, were you always a died in the wool history buff, or was it something that came later? Uh, you know, I always, I was, I don't um, have a uh, history degree per se, uh, which is sort of something that I was always interested in in pop history. I, I do have an art history degree, uh, which is it, related, um, and you'll you'll definitely notice that um, if you're flipping through the copy of Nations and Canons. Mm-hmm. All of our assets are from the public domain. Um, you know, but part of the reason why I kind of set off on this is that I realized that there's a lot of really great artwork out there um, that you know the copyright has expired. You know, and anything pre uh, nineteen, I want to say twenty eight now, because um, uh, Mickey Mouse stopped fighting it. But um, uh, there, there, there is Mickey quite Mouse a lot. Fighting it because Mickey Mouse was too busy fighting itself. Right, right, right. I mean, Mickey Mouse is never going to 100% give up on that fight. But, um, you know, like we, we got the Great Gatsby in the public domain, which, you know, uh, I, I'm sure someone's feverishly working on a RPG adaptation uh, of uh, somewhere out there. And, uh, and, and yeah, so I, there's a lot of um, art 
uh, of really just evocative uh, artwork. You know, some of it is sort of uh, didactic, right? It's it's very patriotic. It's it's intentionally trying to to evoke a, a very uh, positive nationalistic spirit. Um, but but there's there's just a lot of uh, really interesting depictions of that time period, and and really they reminded me more than anything else of. Um, uh, of of the type of art that that you would have found in um in in source books you know in in a lot of the color uh ad and d source books particularly mm-hmm. right that's there's sort of a uh, a watercolor or like heavily uh stylized oil paint well you're um you're not too you're not too far off in in that re- in that regard because because um because um, role playing has always existed down a bit downstream from th- from that particular era of warfare and war gaming. Um, one of the one of the earliest teases into um, into role playing as as we understand it was was based on, was based on the was the was the old um, the old Minnesota group's um, um, Napoleonic campaign, which. There's ob- there's obviously a bit of difference between do- between Napoleon and American Revolution, but you are still in that Pike and Shot era. Uh, well, it's the era right after the Pike and Shot. Um, Pike and Shot, uh, if you want to get technical, um, ends roughly around um, the Glorious Revolution, right? So like eighteen, yeah. sorry, sixteen uh, eighties. Uh, um, you know, it, it kind of it stretches and those sorts of Infantry tactics are still used, particularly in in places like Eastern Europe um, or the Middle East uh, with with the Ottomans, where um, you know uh, you you didn't have the the latest developments in military doctrine. Kind of mm-hmm. they, they they rippled out. Um, but what we're trying to uh, accomplish with nations and cannons is what's called the quote long 18th century, which is a terrible name, um, but generally understood by historians to refer to. Um, you know, uh, post glorious revolution, up to about end of the Napoleonic Wars. So we're talking like 1685 to uh, 1815, give or take. And with that kind of thing in mind, um, was it, was, um, was the was the idea of was first off was how um well I'd like you to walk me through the the um the moment the moment when you when you realized that you could use um you could use the fifth edition sandbox to to um do the, to do this particular era especially since well the obvious the obvious elephant in the room you have to deal with is the is the magic question. <laughs> Right. Uh, well, actually, there's, there's there's sort of two elephants, um, uh, and one one is a war elephant with cannons mounted on it, which is the the firearm question, and then how to handle firearms. Um, so, uh, you know, I first I was working on another project. Um, you know, uh, for for my day job, uh, I'm a producer at uh, a game studio. Um, like I said, based out of New York, uh, we do a lot of gamification, uh, serious games. Um, you know, pr- products that use techniques from the you know the body of uh, interaction sets that you know games have um, to educate, to inspire, um, and to, to to develop um, you know uh, different types of uh, uh, engagement you know with museum pieces and um, you know a peripheral accompanying uh, material uh, apps, all, all kinds of stuff like that, right? So I, I was I was working on a, a Revolutionary War project um, called Revolutionary Choices, um, which is a, uh, a free download um, in the uh, App Store um, that was uh, commissioned by uh, the uh, American Revolution Institute. Um, and that was a project I was working on for several years. Um, uh, and so I, I kind of buried myself in this period in history and, and, and you know, doing a lot of research. Um, I did a lot of art historical research as, as part of that, and that sort of really got me uh, thinking, you know, and I was I was running a couple of my own 5e campaigns at the time, um, and just all these ideas were kind of percolating in the back of my head. Uh, the eureka moment, I'll say, was um, 
when I thought, how would muzzle loader combat function in something like fifth edition in something like fifth edition's turn structure um, a muzzle loader or, or a flintlock you know uh, for, for those of you who don't know um is you know it, it's a, a weapon uh that you know like a musket um that has to be loaded by um holding it to the ground um and and physically driving uh, a musket ball um and powder you know with a ramrod down the barrel um so that's a long load process right uh the best trained British infantrymen of the era, um, you know, in the world were able to get off maybe four shots a minute. And that's under like ideal optimal conditions, right? Like let alone, you know, that's kind of the, the pandemonium of a battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, I thought about that and, and it's sort of the, uh, the way that time breaks down in sort of the round structure in D and D. Um, and you, you have this sort of this notion of, um, uh when what the uh the player might be doing with their action um and so okay if you've got um if you've got a gun <laughs> um how do you balance a gun right because there there are a, a million different uh you know settings out there right the, um or or homebrew hacks or, or what have you that take firearms and try and port them to D D. Um, and they're they're basically crossbows, right? I mean, they've got a, a bunch of special properties, um, but their damage is kind of on par with a crossbow, right? Because anything more than that is really kind of overpowered. Um, you you can't dramatically uh, reinvent the amount of damage that a martial class is going to be able to dish out. Mm -hmm. um, but what you can do is um, is change the kind of the the relationship between uh, base damage and the action economy. And so all of the um, muskets and rifles and pistols you know that we have, um, almost all of them are the, the stats that we include uh, in our rules uh, are you know, they're they're what's called reload one um, technically in in, in, uh, in from a mechanical standpoint, which is they can only hold a single shot and then they must be reloaded. Um, so what you get is kind of burst damage where, um, you know, uh, a musket does uh, the, your average musket does 2d8 damage at range. Um, and that's, you know, that's without getting into, uh, upgrades and, and better, uh, level equipment and, and anything like that. Right. Uh, which is a tremendous amount of damage. Um, but after firing, it needs to be reloaded and reloading is an action. Um, or technically, uh, you can swap one uh, one action or one attack uh, for it. it. Sort of scales up once you get extra attack features. Um, but the 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 basis of of everything is sort of reimagining, recontextualizing, like what um, you know, what damage is, how much damage an individual can output, right? Mm. Um, and uh, you know, from there we kind of th came up with this idea of war gear, which is you know sort of a light. Um, loadout system, which allows you to strap on, you know, uh, a couple of belt loops, which might serve as holsters, or a, you know, a baldric over your back, or you can uh, holster a long rifle, um, and and that effectively means that an individual can carry into battle multiple loaded firearms. Um, this is this is a, a pretty significant uh, shift because suddenly your adventuring party is capable of dishing out tremendous amounts of damage um now you know you balance it in such a way so that these types of upgrades that there there's a cost um uh a pro and a con and and you kind of set it up in such a way so that um there are incentives to kind of use different types of equipment but uh it, it really starts to feel like the players are um in this heroic larger than life sort of a team of the revolution role right where you are serving as light infantry, um, where if you, on a mission, ambush, you know, uh, a patrol of, uh, of of footmen, which is our, our sort of stand-in for the British regular soldier, right? Um, you and your adventuring party can uh, wreak havoc to that group of enemies, um, you know, and then uh, potentially fade back into the underbrush, uh, which is what happened a lot in in the the revolution um with these these types of foraging parties and and rangers uh and and particularly irregular operations are happening uh in in the south in the mid and late stages of the war mm -hmm. 
Now, with now with that with that in mind, the other th the other thing that I was curious about is because bal balancing guns is one thing, but I think an, I think another question to um c to consider to consider is how do you, is balancing guns against uh, against other forms of ranged weaponry like say bows? Right. Um. So we had, we had a couple of different passes at this actually. Um. So. We have a system called roles. Um, roles replace uh, races in standard D&D, &D, um, because obviously in a historical setting, everyone's a human. If everyone used the basic human stats, it would kind of get pretty boring. You wouldn't have a lot of variety. Um, and so roles are kind of meant to evoke your, um, uh, your, your upbringing, um, the the skills and and sort of professions that you've trained in, right? Like uh, not not literal skills, but you know the 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 ways that you've kind of um, shaped yourself to be a soldier, um, or 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 even not a soldier, uh, you know, um, uh, someone uh, uh, who, who could gather intelligence, um, operate behind enemy lines. You know, uh, one of the roles is is even called the renegade, um, which is specifically supposed to be. Um, outlaws or or people who are you know uh, counterculture uh, counter revolutionaries right just um, anybody who uh, rebels against the norm or I guess in this case rebels against the rebellion. Um, one of those roles is called the scout, um, and that role is is very intentionally borrowing um, from indigenous traditions. Um, it's it, it has a lot of different traits, uh, and it's it's. The, the sort of the write-up, the description of, of the history there is um, this is a role that might be appropriate for um, uh, members of any of the various indigenous nations that fought either with or against uh, the uh, Americans during the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, folks who uh, lived on the frontier who adopted the sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, call it what you will, um, but the, one of the historical terms is the style of Indian warfare, right, um, that that heavily utilized um, guerrilla tactics, um, uh, sort of si striking silently, um, and uh, being able to be heavily mobile uh, through the underbrush. Um, and then, you know, folks who were in the middle, right, um, oftentimes uh, where the frontier was uh, and where you had these uh, colonial elements and indigenous elements come in contact, there was often friction um, and and conquests. Uh, but sometimes there were there were pairings or entire groups of people that um, you know uh, grew out of of that. Um, uh, the the best example um, that you know is sort of extant today um, is the Métis people in uh, in what well, was New France, is today Canada, um, that, that are a kind of a, a, a mixed ethnicity um, that grew out of uh, uh, where these pioneers um, would uh, develop f friendly trading relationships and, and intermarriages um, with uh, the indigenous peoples. And so the scout role um, has a number of different traits. Um, one of them they get, is, I think it's called natural weapons, um, uh, where which effectively is a, a buff to the damage of uh, simple weapons. Um, simple weapons, simple uh, mar melee weapons, and also simple ranged weapons, and specifically um, the uh, longbow as well. I think the short bow is normally a simple weapon. The longbow is a, a martial weapon. We, we call out the, the longbow specifically uh, to include it in that feature. And, and so that makes um, anyone using those weapons a bit more powerful. Um, there's, a, there's an innate benefit of if everybody is firing every other round or swapping, you know, getting through a, a limited number of uh, loaded guns that they've got with them, and you're just there with your bow, and you're just firing an arrow with every attack. That also, you know, th th that there's a sort of a tempo change there. And the last thing that we tried to do um, to kind of uh, give a benefit to that um, was we built out a poison system, uh, because you know th it was very much at the time um, you did have uh, poisons used in hunting. Um, and in some cases, tribal warfare um, between uh, the uh, groups like the Cherokee Nation um, and the Muscogee, uh, and among others, and and, and this this becomes uh, very prevalent. The sort of the further south you get, uh, you know, as as the toxicity of animals kind of becomes more and more um, 
extreme, right? So it, it, especially in, in um, Mexico, Central America, right? This, this, there's, there's a lot of utilization of, of poison um, and poison on the battlefield um, in kind of a limited capacity. Uh, but, you know, the, if, if the, the fantasy that we're trying to convey is that you are this kind of, you know, elite, you know, under cover or behind enemy lines operative, then yeah, you might have a, a dose of poison or two with you. Um, and so we have some tools that allow you to, you know, conjure poisons so that you, you have, you're not, you don't need to spend all of your money on, on being able to actually be able to do damage output, but, but uh, applying those poisons to arrows and having that be a, a slight damage uh, buff as well. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> with, with that in mind, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to get into the um, the fact that you've you've you have you have we already mentioned some some of the changes when it came to the whole role thing for um for your for a character's origins. So I'd like to get into the classes thing since we dipped into that a little bit, but I but sure. I but I kept but I wanted to hold off on do on doing a deep dive on that until we until we were until we dedicated um to that. Um, so. Uh, Ranger was our big bugbear, right? Where we were trying to think, you know, um, how does spellcasting make sense? How do we, how do we flavor this in a way that fits? If you look at the Ranger's spell lists, you know, um, a lot of those spells actually do kind of make sense in a mundane context, right? Like things like, um, uh, Pass Without Trace, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or the um any of the you know abilities that let you um set a trap or um a, a alarm right um things like the um some some of the, the light curative elements um and, and even some of the ranger spells like hunter's mark i think you know it's 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 very it doesn't really have uh, a supernatural element uh to it at all hunter's mark um, doing more damage with the power of racism <laughs> um well or, or or you know against a specific target it doesn't need to be uh uh against all I, all orcs uh, it, it yeah. might just be that orc um because fuck because fuck that guy in particular fuck that orc in particular yeah um but you know like but some of the other ranger spells are a bit they're harder to grok right like you know like rangers get access to uh, water breathing and water walk and you know wind wall and and, and stuff like that and and ultimately what we realized, uh, my uh, collaborators and I, was that um, we can't get rid of magic in 5e because the game would be boring if it's just martial casters. I mean, magic is one of the main fundamentals of, of how the system works. Um, having access to you know a limited resource with like dis powerful, discrete abilities is a, is a really valuable role playing tool. And so we came up with this idea of. Um, uh, what we called gambits um and this is similar to how the artificer works if you're familiar with that uh it you know it, it is just a reflavoring of magic all the rules are fundamentally the same but when someone you know quote casts a spell in nations and canons what they're doing and what we encourage players to kind of come up with clever explanations for is you know uh a a trick of uh, of of gumption or daring do, right? Um, uh, pulling the wool over someone's eyes, uh, fast talking them, uh, you know, stepping up back into the shadows or slyly setting up a trap, uh, you know, uh, it, it, in just a couple of moments, so that when an enemy walks by, they can trigger it and be surprised. It, you know, it, it's it's ways and and kind of some uh, a couple narrative tools so that you can. Um, use a lot of the baseline spells from 5e um, in a mundane world. And the other component to that, you know, um, was we came up with new gambits, I think almost 30 of them in, in this printing. Um, and, and those are really, those are our bread and butter. They're supposed to evoke like what a, what non-magical casting could be. Like what, what could be a cool, powerful, kind of limited but like also you know um uh borrowing from things like warfare of the time um i already talked about poisons um uh colonial medicine um with you know leechcraft and and balancing the of the humors um this notion of 
uh, rabble rousers and criers and you know uh, the these uh, speakers on the corners of uh, storefronts and and streets who would just do their best to persuade folks um, to to declare for one side or the other, right? Um, so there's a lot of like rich kind of uh, material. Oh, uh, espionage, right? There's so much to mine there in terms of like the sort of weird, sneaky, like almost modern uh, intelligence gathering systems that um, you know uh, things like the the Culper Ring and Washington's other spy networks and the sort of uh, their counterparts among the British um, and the whole apparatus that ultimately convinced Benedict Arnold to defect. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff there that we've built into these, you know, these gambits um, as as these these discrete, mundane spell effects. And so for the Ranger, you know, um, we we specifically built a lot of abilities um, that that dive into, you know, Ranger with a lowercase R, like what a, what a colonial Ranger might be, like a Ranger from the. Uh, uh, the French and Indian War, right, or uh, or even from the the later you know American tradition, um, uh, like hiding under brush, um, tools for uh, rapid escalade and um, uh, and and hoisting up your allies, um, uh, other types of surprise attacks, and um, you know applying war paint. Uh, uh, one of my favorites actually uh, is is just called fugas. A lot of these are actually. Um, French terms, um, because we kind of realized that like French and Latin words already feel like spells a little bit. Like if it's if it has the right kind of like cadence and the right tone of phrase, like it 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 can kind of fall into a a, a similar uh, feel as something like um, gosh, just hideous laughter, right? Uh, and, and so a, a fugas uh, 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 is just a pit that is dug into the ground and filled with gunpowder. Um, and they, this can be used either as a mortar. Um, when you dig the pit, you kind of angle it in a certain direction. So you, you point it, you know, over there, and then you uh, you pull the trigger basically by um, uh, detonating a length of wire, uh, triggering a length of wire that detonates gunpowder, and just blasts forth, you know, all the rock and rubble that you've buried um, in this gunpowder pit uh, 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 at, at that destination. Or um, you just leave it there as kind of an improvised landmine. Um, and there's, there's lots of, of weird stuff there coming out of frontier warfare and coming out of uh, the, the, the strange and crazy uh, tricks that these types of regular fighters would get up to. When they were resource limited, they had to um, double down and use the best of their environment and use the best of what they had on hand. And so that's the ranger subclass that we created called Trailblazers, trying to evoke that sensibility. And, and now and, and and with that with that in mind, you do have as I understand it, you do have one brand spanking new class that isn't a subclass of a, of something that already exists, and that is the firebrand. That's correct. Yeah. So uh, we we sat down and we thought about like what classes make sense in a mundane setting. Um. And and the 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 ones the big ones are ranger, rogue, fighter, barbarian. Um, and we were kind of at a loss for, you know, something to, to occupy what would traditionally be the party role of a spellcaster, you know, um, Ranger can kind of do it supplementally and, and our trailblazer is kind of intended to be a, uh, a spell first, uh, Ranger, but, uh, the firebrand, um, is, is like a fusion between the, uh, you know, aspects of, uh, paladin and bard and cleric. Um, and you know, wrapped up in in kind of a, a you know some period uh, appropriate flair. So uh, they have two subclasses at their disposal. Uh, one is called demagogue, um, who is you know the the, uh, the <laughs> who vicious mockery is their bread and butter. They have bonuses, uh, you know, to to deploying psychic damage and 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 a number of demoralizing effects. Um, and and they're uh, the sort of um, angry. Uh, venomous leader whose who's vitriol uh, will either um, uh, just uh, completely um, 
debuff enemies in the battlefield or in a social scenario, right? Um, they get one ability called Tar and Feather, which lets them run the mayor out of town. Um, if they roll well, uh, it, it also can backfire. So if, if they don't roll good, then they get run out of town. Um, the other one is, uh, is, is Chaplain. Uh, and the Chaplain is, um, it's trying to be, you know, the sort of the, the army, um, uh, minister um who would accompany troops um you know who has uh, bonuses to um uh, healing effects to temporary hit points um has uh, a number of ways to like aid their allies and be an inspirational force mm -hmm. uh, these are kind of two sides of the same coin right um in development uh the examples that i gave were uh were john adams and sam adams Right. Um, the John Adams, you know, famously, uh, he really was like the paladin of his day. Right. He's very uh, uh, staunch, uh, you know, believer in, in ethics and the rule of law. Um, there is a, an instance during the Boston Massacre where the uh, Redcoat soldiers, who, who really at the time were mobbed by, you know, a bunch of dissenters uh, who, who pelted them with snowballs with uh rocks inside um you know that there was a uh a, a huge propaganda war um between uh some of the, the more militant patriots at the time who labeled the whole thing a massacre when um in reality so these soldiers were at least in their mind they fired uh, in self-defense and then after the first round of shots went out they um they withdrew uh and and didn't you know escalate the scenario and so john adams at the time you know argued even though he believed sort of you know he was sort of on the fence right but he, he did believe a lot of the same things that people like the sons of liberty who are, are one of our playable backgrounds by the way um but but john adams believed in a lot of those principles but he also believed in the rule of law um and so he served as the attorney for those redcoat soldiers um and and successfully got um most of their convictions thrown out um in court which is a tremendous feat you know kind of given the partisan leadings of boston at the time um and meanwhile his brother uh or his cousin sam adams was the one of the leaders who was trying to get out go out there and rile up that dissent you know he was the one creating um these pamphlets um working in hand in hand with people like paul revere mm -hmm. to uh really stoke uh you know this this kind of uh anti-british fervor right foment revolution um and and using the the scapegoats of the soldiers from the boston massacre as, as one of their prime examples um and and it's, it's these two different there, there are different ways that people go to revolution, and that is is kind of uh, what Firebrand is supposed to be about. Um, the core chassis of the class has um, abilities that let them, you know, gain access to even though they're a fifth level caster along the lines of a paladin um, or a ranger, they have a limited ability to upcast, which is they have a resource pool that they can use to uh, pull down effects from their their domain list effectively and and cast them uh on par at, at the same level that a, a wizard or a cleric might be able to which gives them a lot more utility um and they also have a couple of cool abilities like um uh, my favorite is called pamphleteer mm -hmm. where they can they, they write a sternly uh, written note you know they, they they scribe a letter and they can inscribe one of their gambits into that letter put it in the post and then when a target who could be an enemy, could be an ally, but what have you, right? Um, reads the letter, they they receive the the benefit, or the uh, more often than not, the the debuff of that spell. Um, you know, so the the it, it is the how uh, would influential uh, folks, um, you know, uh, people uh, of letters, people leading the call to revolution. What skill set would they have? And then, kind of, what. Uh, what would their tactics be? How would they they choose to um, to to go about, uh, you know, uh, joining the cause? Mm -hmm. And that's something that we we think is really important is that you know not to necessarily paint the um, Revolutionary War in this rosy light. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff that happened, and and there were war crimes, and there were atrocities, and they happened on all sides, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I think that's that's a really fertile space for role playing. You know, I, I think on the one hand, if you just want to be your colonial A team who's just going in muskets blazing, um, you know, blowing blowing up a bunch of redcoats, 
that's cool. The game totally lets you play that way. But if you want to dig deeper into kind of the nuance, um, you know, of what happens when uh, a rebellion or an insurrection turns ugly, um, you know, as as happened in some of the internecine warfare between loyalists and uh, patriot partisans, um, and this this really prefigures a lot of the uh, the fighting that would happen in, in subsequent conflicts like um, the Peninsular War during the Napoleonic campaign um, and the French Revolution, of course, right? Um, where you had, you know, brother against brother uh, in very, very bloody actions and both both sides feeling ideologically justified. Um, and I think that, that that is really, if your playgroup wants to lean into that, um, I think that can tell some really neat stories because you're fighting for what you believe in, not to, you know, save the world from the evil necromancer. Mm -hmm. And with now to, although, although to be quite honest, if, um, if I'm running the, if I'm running nations and cannons, I'm not using the A team as my template. Um, okay. I'm using Inglorious Bastards as my template. <laughs> yeah, nope, that's that's the modern version. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's sim simply be simply because simply because of the fact that well one well one um I I think it I think it'd be in, I think it'd be interesting to have have that particular but bring in a bit of that um, lawlessness of. Things work. Things work differently out here, and the line is, the the line is not just blurry; it's gone. Um, because that because that's that's always been the kind of the kind of story that, the kind of story that I like. Maybe it's maybe it's because of all the frontier stories that I that I ended up getting exposed to living in Minnesota. Um, but I but I always find that kind of thing interesting. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I. I... So instead, so you so you could eat so in that kind of thing, I'd easily have it where the where they're in a place where the whole the whole national lines aren't aren't as much of a thing because pe because people are just trying to not get eaten by bears. <laughs> because because, be because bears are na are North America's equivalent of fuck around and find out. Um, there's also there's also the fact that I ended up reading Hatchet when I was a little kid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Same, may, same here. That may have contributed, and I, I know, I know that got made into a TV movie called A Cry in the Wild, but I, I'd like to not think about that for the same reason <laughs> I'd like to not think about the time they tried making the K into a movie. Which, uh, uh, oh yeah, now let's uh, <laughs> let's give it a wide berth. Um, let's not, let's let's not and say we did. <laughs> um. I'd but and, and that's that those types of survivalist stories actually yeah. like that that is another uh, that's another like sort of uh well of inspiration that we we dug into um because uh when we were coming up with ideas of how enemies might run you know um the on the one hand you know you are going to have a lot of redcoats and a lot of different types of redcoats and and you know uh redcoat officers and redcoat cavalrymen and and how uh you know they, they might use different tactics and diff different uh be trained in in different types of fighting mm -hmm. um but also for 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 a variety's sake um you gotta have beasts you gotta have something right uh yeah. there's 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 all that uh that wildlife and you know okay so there are already stats for for bears right for black mm -hmm. bears and 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 brown bears um uh but we were we were thinking really hard about what is the scariest animal that we can come up with that like could actually pose a threat um to like a party of level uh, level two adventurers um and and wouldn't you know it <laughs> the result was the moose um yeah and, and, and <laughs> the bull kidding. moose is is CR uh, CR I think it's one or two um, I, I, it, it's it's one of those but it, it is it is an absolutely terrifying foe um, and if you see a moose in the wilderness um, like if you got all your muskets out like maybe you got a shot but boy you do not want to piss that thing off no it's just I um to be quite to be quite honest in that kind of situation I th I think shoot unless you unless you can get the eyes um, shooting that thing is a waste of good bullets and well try um 
the idea of the idea of shooting for of shooting for the eyes with with considering considering rifle accuracy around that time, especially if you had smooth bores. <laughs> um, accuracy is more of a suggestion than than anything else, especially since the the sole reason the one of the big reasons smooth bores were were around were even around at that time is because they were cheap. Um, because what because one of the one of the unwritten rules of combat is your weapon was made by the lowest bidder, but there's but there's also the there's also the fact that instead of going straight they would actually curve because the bullet was um a bit loose in the barrel. Yep, you wanted something that was uh, yeah, reliable in the field that um you know could be easily repaired and uh, mass produced, right? Mm-hmm. And so the the Brown Bess musket, which is what the British use and you know a, a lot of uh, of Continental soldiers as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it was effectively the AK-47 of its day, right? Um, it wasn't particularly fancy. It wasn't, um, you know, the the most accurate uh, uh, ver- version or variant of a a muzzleloader musket. Um, it it didn't have all the bells and whistles, but boy, it could take a beating. You could trudge through the wilderness um, and bang that thing against, you know, every uh, log and tree branch um, from here to Kansas. Um, is, well, here to Ken- here to Kentucky. Gun. It is the perfect gun for people who don't know how to maintain guns. Yeah. Which, which is, and the sole reason I say that is because that's exactly what, what I, what, what um people have told me about the about the AK. Um, exactly. Although that whole thing about rolling it in the dirt and and it'll and it'll work that's not exactly true. <laughs> um. Well, folk tales, you know. Yeah. Um. I mean, the big the big thing is once the safety's off, there's that big ass hole in the side, and you get you get the inside of that with say dirt, and it's not going to work. But I would like to cover a bit of the a bit of the a bit of the sub the uh, subclasses that you're going in, and I'll start from the top with the barbarian subclass in grenadier. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, grenadier was our attempt to. If you look at Barbarian, um, a lot of its abilities are melee focused, right? Like almost all of them, right? You, you can't really build a ranged Barbarian under normal circumstances. Um, and uh, Barbarian is great because uh, it has a very different play style, um, especially in uh, in a, a setting where you have you know tremendous amounts of damage flying back and forth. Um, you know, it, it sort of uh, evokes that um, you know the, the the kind of the heavy. Um, who could get hit with a musket ball, you know, uh, four, five, six times, and and keep on going, which was not common <laughs> when when you get hit by a you know a, a seventy caliber uh, uh, bullet effectively. Um, but there were there are certainly a, a lot of examples and, and you know a lot of folk tales of of you know these figures uh, who who you know just stormed the field. Um, anyway, the barbarian, the grenadier is built around uh the notion of grenades um and and also throwing weapons uh and so it kind of marries this idea of um you know grenade a grenade might be kind of a, a rare or expensive thing um they get a couple abilities to i think summon grenades at a certain point so you know they, they can uh utilize their specialty there um but also you know uh if you're a grenadier you might be uh pound around with a boarding axe you know, or or uh, a hand axe, which is you know the the stats are are basically a, a tomahawk, um, and uh, and hurling that thing and applying your your rage bonus to it, um, and 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 a couple other ways to just get up close, um, to uh, get within throwing range or melee range, um, and and just do as much damage as possible uh, to the enemy line, mm-hmm. and grenades are very valuable. Um, and and when, when we're talking about grenades, let's be clear, we're talking about those, you know, the things you see in, in like pirate cartoons, right? Like it's a big crude hunk of iron with a lit fuse at the end of it, uh, just stuffed full of gunpowder. Um, and they, they were not reliable weapons. Um, and so we, we have, uh, you know, the, the misfire rules that, that we have, um, if you misfired your gun, your gun jams. If you misfire at a grenade, well, that grenade detonates, uh, you know, in your face um, oh, to catastrophic results. Uh, and so uh, the the brilliant part about the grenadier is that they can use reckless attack with 
grenades and thrown weapons. So they want to be recklessly attacking because they really don't want those grenades, you know, uh, uh, blowing up in their hands. Um, and so that that reduces the chance of them rolling that dreaded nat one um, and sort of a high risk, high reward uh, strategy. And uh, grenades are very effective at tightly packed enemy formations like redcoats who are lined up to, you know, unleash a volley fire. Mm-hmm. And when it comes, when it comes to when it comes to the, that, brings me to another to another thing. Um, I I realize that now, given the, given the fact that um, vanilla D and D isn't going to be using these sort these sort of thrown explosives all that much. Um, how what's your what's your take on the idea of using scatter in com- so, in uh, combat? Yeah, so scatter. Uh, we 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 have a property called scatter for firearms. Uh, that's certainly it's supposed to be like uh, things like a blunderbuss. Get get it, and it functions similar to a grenade. Um, and that's um, you you make an attack, um, and if you hit your the target, um, the creatures within you know an X radius for for most scatter like buckshot weapons. It's I believe uh, five foot radius. Mm. Um, have to make a save. Or they take the weapon's damage as well, um, and there's oh, there's a lot of different ways we could have done that. Um, there's a secondary mechanic that we have also called um, uh, close uh, um, close quarters, or uh, it might be uh, point blank. I think it's point blank, um, which is supposed to be like you've got a shotgun. Um, the effectiveness of this gun is going to diminish um, the uh, further you are from the enemy. So that doesn't do uh, a spread. It focuses on a single target, but the closer you are, the more dice of damage that you roll um, with your, you know, your your musket loaded with buckshot. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- we had a lot of different conversations about trying to figure out how to integrate rules. D20 Modern, you know, uh, has uh, I I can't list you know like 10 15 different firearm properties um and we wanted to ultimately find something that was kind of streamlined kind of straightforward like fit into the 5e um you know uh, tool set without um really becoming like uh incredibly complex and so i think those systems are they're um slightly abstract but uh, the payoff is that you don't have to do a lot of complex math or like figure out like you're you're not sitting there like mapping out squares or doing other things that you might otherwise do um, in the, in a system that has you know heavy firearm specific interactions like that. Yep. And so next so next on the list is the turncoat for the fighter. This is probably my favorite. Um, we thought really hard for the fighter about what. What, what what is a fighter? Uh, oh, the fighter is a soldier, right? Well, what is a soldier? A so- soldier is not a subclass, right? Soldier is just a definition. Um, and so we were th- looking more at things like, um, you know, some of the uh, existing sub fighter subclasses in in uh, books like Tasha's and uh, the uh, Xanathar's book, um, Samurai and Cavalier, right? Where where the fighter subclasses have kind of a theme to them. They're trying to they're they're trying to uh, have you know a, a little bit of narrative framework there, in addition to just you get new skills that let you beat people up better. Uh, and Turncoat is uh, it's it's our Benedict Arnold class. Um, it it is modeled after the path um, of the Totem Water Warrior. Uh, barbarian, which means that you have a number of chicaneries. Uh, you you get new chicaneries every level, right? So every uh, or every you know uh, X levels whenever you you get a new subclass feature, and you can pick one, and they're all kind of arranged around a different theme. Uh, there's the cutthroat, who's uh, focused on poisoning. Um, the informant, um, who's kind of like a, a spy, you know, operator saboteur. Uh, and oh gosh, I'm blanking on the third one. Um, uh, a, a mercenary, right? Who is like, you know, they they are uh, middle of the, lo- the road. They will do, um, you know, they'll take a job. They'll fight for pay. They have some some neat abilities. One of the ones they get is um, uh, they can effectively 
like walk up to uh, their buddy and put him in a headlock, right? Sort of the action movie cliche of um, uh, nobody move because because I, I I got him, you know. Uh, and and so you can bluff to your enemies that you are about to join their side by uh, by grappling one of your allies. Um, and then, you know, when the moment is right, uh, you can trigger the ability as reaction, and, and then you you can uh, make a bunch of attacks with advantage, um, mm-hmm. which is which is great. Um, except that when we were writing it, uh, we didn't realize specifically that we had to specify uh, that this ability only works against enemies of intelligence that had intelligence of four or greater, or whatever the the threshold is. Because technically, otherwise, you could be in the wild, you could find that moose wandering around. Um, and you can put your buddy in a headlock and say, don't move, Moose, I'm on your side, <laughs> and get the Moose to drop his guard. Wasn't so. there a bear who thought, wasn't there a guy who, th- who thought that he had befriended a, a bunch of, a bunch of bears and then he got eaten for his trouble? Uh, uh I feel like that is the story, uh, told throughout time that, that keeps happening because people do not learn their lesson about bears. <laughs> well, the Darwin Awards has existed for years and it's going to keep existing, I'm sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, unless you're playing Sir Barrington, I suppose. Yeah, but yeah, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not even. I'm not even playing. I'm not even playing. Um, King, I'm not even playing King Bear. <laughs> he's too. He's too busy being Russian. Oh boy, yeah. Um, but. But. The next one, the next one that I have on the list, as soon as soon as the document decides to um, play nice with me, and this is this is the one that we that was that was the um, big bugbear, as you pointed out, and that's the trailblazer for the ranger, which I do like that it has a, that it, that it's it's do it's doing the thing that I I argued with my with my colleague Ash, um, the ranger should the ranger should have done from the beginning, and that being the ranger should be king of messing with terrain. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Thank. Thank you. Uh, uh, very much for that. Um, they, they, they. There. There is. Um, unfortunately, in in D anD D, right? Just exploration. Uh, the way that D anD D handles exploration is that ranger abilities turn exploration off. They. 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 They win. They have the one, I win button for the exploration mini game. Um, which you know. Uh, it. It means that like if you got a ranger in your party, you solve the problem, and if you don't. You have a problem, and and that's kind of boring. Um, we we that's a whole another conversation, and, and definitely a system, a subsystem that we're interested in uh, tinkering with in the future. Um, but the Trailblazers specifically, they have a bunch of abilities, um, and I feel like the internet is going to crucify me when I say this. But they have a bunch of abilities that are uh, hinge off of their favored terrain. Um, and I know nobody likes favorite terrain, um, and everybody replaces their option of favorite terrain with like the new features that were given in the Xanatars book if they play if they play a five E ranger. But Trailblazer specifically, um, it, it has almost uh, domain spells, including a a cantrip um, that they get based on their choice of a terrain, um, and they have a number of other abilities that you know increase as they level. Um, they can um, cast. Uh, uh, some certain spells as a ritual, they have a limited ability to do so, um, and they can also cast uh, certain uh, spells or, or gambits, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, they can reduce the casting time from one minute to one action, um, which may not sound like a long time, but in in a combat scenario, that's everything, mm-hmm. right? Because one minute casting cast time is completely uh, you can't do it in combat at all. But um, and we've added a couple of new gambits specifically for this purpose. One is called Barbed Spike, um, which is, is a, a sort of a spike that you would jam into um, either a hinge, like a door to like wedge it shut, um, or into the touch hole of a cannon um, to prevent that artillery from from firing at you. And um, you know that's normally like that requires like taking out your hammer and pounding the damn thing in, right? And that that normally has a minute cast time. Um, but a trailblazer could just you know whip it out and 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 find a way to just very rapidly uh, deploy that. Likewise, there's another uh, spell we have called Entrap, where you can either um, uh, buff kind of a standard bear trap, hunting trap that that already exists in in baseline 5e, or you can uh, deploy a uh, a musket on a tripwire, um, which which historically happened right Mm -hmm. um there there's a phenomenon uh called the cemetery gun where uh you know the rich folks would set up these these traps um by their mausoleums 
uh, to deter body snatchers because body snatchers uh, sure did uh, it was it was a lucrative uh, profession uh, when selling to medical students of the day who were trying to uh, practice their anatomy. Um, so yeah, uh, some of the trailblazers' abilities are they can interact with stuff like that to, to happen on a you know a, an in combat time scale. And then the, the most interesting ability the trailblazer gets um, is called choke point, uh, where they can kind of assess the terrain around them and uh, use that to set up an, an advanced gambit um, without um, without expending a slot for it. And that is uh, that that has an ability where the user rolls a survival check mm -hmm. um and i i have a a whole spreadsheet of special math for this but effectively a survival check um when you're in your favorite terrain um is treated as though you have expertise um and then they have other abilities later on as they level up where they they increase that that bonus and increase that bonus um and this is supposed to be maybe when half the party is taking a short rest the trailblazers out there like scouting the enemy they find the perfect spot and they set up like a a, a place for an ambush mm -hmm. and they, they make this check and it can be a really hard check right it scales all the way up to a dc 40 survival check uh to cast a level five spell um and and so you can do things like um deploy a wall of fire um or you know uh, i think the flavor text mentions um setting out uh you know jars of sugar water um to, to lure insects for insect plague and it, it's the the Ability is, is it's written in a way where it's supposed to like encourage you to flavor. Um, I want to like set this cool trap, um, you know, and like I, I can pull from the, the rogues gallery of like some neat 5e spells that normally don't make any sense in a mundane context, right? Like, um, but how could I do that? How could I do that by like exploiting the lay of the land? Um, and you know, that that is like I think that summarizes our relationship with magic um and that like there are lots of really cool abilities uh and spells that are like people that are iconic that people really like um that add like tactical abilities and we want to like bring as many of those into like a historical context as possible we just have to kind of build the right uh framework so that we can give you abilities to let you do cool stuff like that and then feel really like powerful and tricky for being able to pull something like that off mm-hmm and I can when it come when it, whenever it comes to the whole that whole favored terrain thing, I've al I've never been against the idea of it. It's it's always in the um ex it's always in the execution because well one of the big one of the big problems with rangers is that it's st it's still much like a lot of archetypes it's still very um British for lack of a better term. <laughs> I know I know that the ranger is supposed to be based on the rangers of the north from Tolkien but well to well given given what he was drawing from it still applies um now with with that in mind the next the next one uh, the next one on my list is the um uh, marksman for the rogue so i have a problem with rogue the rogue class which is that the rogue class is the, the sneak attack is just so goddamn powerful that all the rogue subclasses are extremely hamstrung in what they can give the rogue and how they can make the rogue interesting. You can't overload the rogue with too many goodies; the rogue just breaks the damn game. Um, and this is why rogue has this really weird progression, where they get like uh, their subclass at level three, and they don't get anything else until level nine, and there's just this bunch of like weird white space, um, which which doesn't feel terribly like engaging but then there is kind of a class fantasy built into the rogue already that you know uh that supports a lot of different types of characters so you know i could kind of see where it got there um when we built the marksman our intention was to give a rogue like tools um similar to warlock invocations um, that you know they have a uh, they get a table and they get a progression system um, where they learn a number of techniques as they level up um, outside of that that sort of standard subclass uh, level model um, and these techniques some of them have level prerequisites but they're they're um, effectively they're supposed to be uh, trick shots right there there are different ways that you as a rifleman as a marksman as a sniper 
um, might, uh, you know, uh, know how best to uh, to take out your enemies. And so you've got some ones like, one is is you pack too much powder into the um, the muzzle of the gun, and um, it uh, it increases your misfire chance, but it it, it um, does a significant damage uh, increase. Um, there's there's one um, that uh, uh, specifically allows you when you're using a bow, um, you know, is that sort of that iconic Robin Hood? Um, you you shoot an enemy and you you pin uh, part of their uniform or their clothing, um, you know, to a, a nearby wall or a log, and and they have to spend their action to free themselves. Otherwise, they they're, they're restrained. They can't move. Um, there are there are some other ones that that give them limited access to uh, certain gambits, right? So certain gambits that um, are uh, of themselves supposed to be trick shot. Uh, there's a gambit called ricochet, uh, which allows you to either hit two targets um, in a row or to bounce your shot um, around a blind corner to hit uh, you know a target that might be concealed, um, which is you know it's, it's a little uh a, a little fast and loose with like the actual uh, physics of how a uh you know a, a flintlock weapon fires but it you know it's it's supposed to be a, a higher level ability that like uh, you know a a very uh a keen trained uh marksman who's been at this their whole life would do um it's another one called blowback um which when a grenade is is tossed at you you can actually uh deflect it uh, so you shoot you shoot the grenade out of the air and uh you make an opposed attack almost like a counter spell and if the opposed attack rolls well uh not only do you deflect the grenade but you deflect the grenade back at the dude who threw it at you and so it blows up on them um the other, you know other other cool things like that um and uh uh that they're it's, it's sort of designed to um, give to, to to lean into that fantasy of being, you know, the 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 guy with the smoking gun mm-hmm. and you know all the the cool tricks up his sleeve, um, without necessarily overpowering, because uh, the rogue already has a high damage output, and um, you add uh, our higher uh, gun damage. Uh, burst damage to that effect and that can get a little scary uh, and so there are other ways in in some of the feats and other things that we're uh, we're pushing um that we want to also incentivize melee rogues because um you know it is dangerous to uh, leave cover and get up uh, close and personal with a bunch of redcoats and so if you do manage to do that you should be rewarded for for that as well yeah now and besides, through through this, we won't have to we won't have to deal with a bunch of a bunch of fishing for fishing for sneak attack slash backstab. This isn't dar- this isn't Dark Souls PvP, people. <laughs> Look, I love I love Dark Souls as much as the next guy, but you know I'm right. <laughs> oh, oh no, I, and and I know that um, you know the 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 sneak attack rule and this is one that everybody gets you know uh everyone has sort of their own weird interpretation of it but um the important one is that if if an ally is within your target and you're using a ranged weapon you can apply sneak attack so this is critical uh rogues rogues don't have uh martial ranged weapon proficiency which is important um because uh you know in nations and cannons we we don't treat guns as a separate proficiency category um it, it there are simple uh, firearms and then there are martial firearms mm-hmm. and so rogues are mostly proficient with uh, pistols and um, you know uh, a rogue might be there you know with a brace of pistols and um, if his buddy is there uh, who's gotten up with a bayonet uh, to uh, pin a, a red coat down and he pulls out his pistol and takes a pot shot um, and applies sneak attack that. That often is enough to drop an enemy soldier uh, in and of itself, and that's that's, that's a really cool, um, you know, interaction. And um, especially when they're dual wielding, um, because you can dual wield pistols, right? And a pistol doesn't do it still does a decent chunk of damage. It doesn't do an extraordinary amount of damage compared to like a musket or rifle. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, you you have to be within uh, I think thirty feet because the range of uh, flintlock pistols is very very short um if you think about you know uh those dueling pistols right and and you know like the, like the famous hamilton duel right duel uh dueling at at uh 30 paces um that that was those were the most technologically advanced uh pistols 
of their day, right? And those were highly, incredibly expensive pieces of machinery. Mm -hmm. And everything else, like any, like a coat pistol, right, or even like a like a horse pistol that an officer might carry, um, it's basically a, a sawed off musket. <laughs> and so you got to be pretty damn close, which which works really well for Rogue. Now, when it now um when it comes to it, when it comes when it comes to feats, you've got you've got a few it you've got a few that you're at, that you're adding in, and I know that um um but despite the fact that Wizards of the Coast is deathly afraid of the feat system um not not everybody is not everybody is afraid of as afraid as their own shadow as Crawford is um uh, but... as as an independent publisher, no comment. <laughs> Look, we 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 here in the temple hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. <laughs> um, but I'd like you, now. Obviously, we can't go through all of the feats; otherwise, we'd be here all night. Um, but I'd like I'd like you to go through a few highlights of some of the feats that are at, that you're adding in that reflect the changes within the setup. Sure. Yeah. So what I was just talking about actually is, is the ruffian feat, right? And this is this is one that kind of breaks the rules, um, but from a very intentional point. The ruffian feat, um, it, it it is borrowing actually from some old three point five stuff where you could, as a rogue, you could multi class and then you could gain back, um, you know, uh, like a level of uh, sneak attack dice as if your rogue level was higher. And um, this allows you to be a barbarian rogue. Right. Um, who then, you know, if, if, if you are a level one rogue um, level, well, let's say you're a level three rogue uh, and uh, a level two barbarian. Um, if you take a fourth level in rogue uh, and you pick up the ruffian feat, um, it allows you to treat uh, your rogue level as if it was two levels higher. So basically you get an extra dice of sneak attack. Um, as if you hadn't multiclassed. Hmm. And that's that's super powerful. It only applies to melee sneak attacks um because it's the the risk reward like i said is is much higher um but but barbarian rogue multi-class is probably one of my favorite combinations um because you can get up close and um we have added a uh, a weapon um that has finesse um and can be used with uh strength um, normally, I think weapons, uh, finesse weapons, can always be used with strength, but it's sort of a unwritten rule, right? It, it, it's uh, it's not really clarified. But um, if you are a barbarian rogue, you don't even really bother with dexterity. <laughs> you just get up close, you reckless attack with strength, um, and you have advantage. So you automatically apply sneak attack, and if something shoots you, whatever, you're raging. So you know um, you can you can soak up uh, a good deal more punishment than a rogue normally might be able to. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that is an example of it's a feat that we built, and it's a it's a powerful. But we're trying to facilitate uh, additional like play styles because the class pool is a lot more limited, right? Than a standard adventuring party. We want to um, build things in such a way so that you can kind of spec out your character, you can customize them, you can kind of have a role, um, you know, and and feel like you you have more control over you know your your play style. Um, there's, uh, there's, we have a, a suite of, uh, of feats in there, uh, for different, uh, fighting styles. So, um, you can specialize in, in rifles or, or carbines. Um, the pistol one I think is, is one of my favorites. Uh, so that's if you're dual wielding pistols. Um, it, it lets you use, uh, pistols that aren't light. Um, so you can use heavier pistols, uh, in, in both hands when you're dual wielding. Um, similar to the normal dual wielding feat. And it has a stipulation where when you reload, uh, when you reload a pistol, uh, you instead reload two pistols. Mm -hmm. So you can be that guy who just marches into the battlefield, guns blazing, um, and just every turn you are taking, um, you know, two shots at uh, at two different targets, or maybe at the same guy you really want to kill, <laughs> um, and uh, and just occasionally. Um, spending your action to to reload when you run out of the the pistols that you've that you've brought with you um and then be able to just just keep guns blazing um it also has a uh a feature that maybe not everyone will use but this is sort of trying to evoke the the kind of the pirate uh sensibility of um when you make a melee attack i think it's when you make a melee attack you then have advantage on your next ranged attack against that target or maybe vice versa but it's it, it um it's it's meant to like facilitate that like 
a sword in one hand, uh, pistol in the other, uh, boarding action mm. type of character. Um, when you mentioned when you mentioned the whole thing with multiple guns and just keeping shooting the th the thing that immediately comes to mind is the is the is the old line. I've got a bullet with your name on it, and I'm gonna keep shooting at you until I find it. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Uh, or or the whole thing of of if I fire enough bullets, I'll eventually hit something. I also known as the DACA rule <laughs> because you can never have enough. Oh no! And well, well, um, that also that that that's that was one of the appeals with the muskets comparatively is the fact that you could, is the fact that you could reload the thing significantly faster. Now, granted, we're now granted we're still t we're still talking. You could only get th you you're only supposed to be getting three shots in a minute, but that's still an improvement. Yeah, the the math falls down a little bit if you think about it too hard. I I recommend when you're running nations and cannons, you adjust the combat time scale from mm -hmm. uh uh six seconds around to something closer to ten seconds around. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, we 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 give a couple of limited abilities um that let people uh reload you know uh quicker uh than than intended. This is this is another. You know, so, so the, the the war gear system, which is like one of the things we're gonna get to mm -hmm. uh, later on. Um, you know, you can either equip uh, holsters that let you carry a couple of sidearms into battle, or you could on on your your waist slot you can carry a um, not a powder keg, um, a powder horn, um, or uh, a, a priming flask, um, which lets you uh, you know the the mechanical benefit that does is once per day you can reload a musket. Um, as a bonus action, um, so that's that's super powerful. Um, it's and it's kind of like it's in line with basically a magic item, uh, a minor magic item that you would kind of spend your money on as you're you're uh, leveling up. Um, but it's it's a way to like push muskets and push muskets into a certain type of of play style. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I, one thing I would like to I would like to ask about is. You have you have a you have a set of rules solely for artillery. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And they were so hard to write. <laughs> is it is it a case is it a case where you where you're th where you where you were throwing you're throwing out draft after draft and banging your head against the wall? Oh oh yeah right? no no it's, this um uh, is probably like a solid three months of work. I mean scattered over the course of the last, like the almost three years of of this project's been in development. But yeah no artillery the the artillery is tricky for for a number of reasons right. Um on the one hand uh it how do you you have to shoot the artillery which means you're making an attack. But you know if you shoot a cannonball which fires in a line, which is it's a line effect, it's a standard line effect, but when a dragon uses a line breath weapon, it's not making an attack. <laughs> what does that attack mean? Um, uh, it's not really aiming it, it just it just happens. But gunnery is such an important part of the time period, you know, um, that uh, making the attack and having the attack roll matter is important. Um, and then likewise, you know, you have the opposite effect where uh, you know, if you're you have commandeer to cannon, which every time I run a session, right, artillery, uh, artillery, there are artillery pieces, mm -hmm. which um, effectively uh, take the place of dragons in this setting, right? They're they're big, uh, stationary, uh, more or less. They they deploy like lots of crazy AOE damage, um, and uh, they are crewed by a number of uh, you know soldiers who you know they have a, a number of crew actions that they take to reload the piece, to prime it, to to prep it, to fire, and 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 all that. Um, and when players kill the crew, which they do uh, as their first target, uh, almost always, they then commandeer the cannon. And if the cannon was loaded before, like if they managed to kill it before it got off its first shot or in the middle of loading, right, then they have a very powerful weapon that they can can uh, turn to their advantage, which which is is great. Um, it's also, it's not a mobile weapon, right? Like they can get off a shot where they are. Um, but uh, in the cannon stat blocks, we list the uh, the weight of the damn thing, and it is extremely heavy. Um, and it's not something you can you know drag uh, through the woods uh, to get to your your next gorilla target. Uh, but 
if you have an individual target, an individual cannon, and you're trying to shoot at a specific target, something like a um, like a ship, right? If you you're you're on like fort mounted artillery and you're trying to you know uh, hit an enemy sloop that's coming into the harbor uh, to to deny it. Well, then that can't be an AOE shot because you're you are specifically making an attack against a discrete vehicle, um, and so ultimately what we uh, decided on was that um, artillery can be loaded with different ordnance, um, and there are different types of ordnance. You know things like uh, uh, grape shot and chain shot and um, uh, uh, w- w- round shot. Um, and they're, they're kind of two different distinctions of round shot, right? One being the anti-personnel, I'm going to shoot this cannonball, it's going to go in a line, it's going to travel, you know, uh, uh, a mile long in a line, and any person who it hits along that way is going to get their foot blown off. And uh, what we call wadded shot, which is, you know, the, the type of shot that does specific uh, damage, that's, that's meant to do damage to a structure or to a, um, to a vehicle. And um, all of those uh, types of ordnance, they have a, a modifier attached to them. Um, and we try to make the math as simple as possible. It's, it's a multiple of three system, where um, AOE shots ha- have uh, reduced range and reduced uh, the number of damage die that the cannon would fire. So um, uh, um, the any one of your... Um, God, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm blanking on the name now, but the the uh, canister shot, right? That um, historically does have a much shorter range than um, any of your just uh, cast iron cannonball. So um, if you fire a canister shot, you um, you look at the the table, and the table gives a you know a modifier of um, you know one third of the normal damage dice and one third of the normal range, and that you know we we have set up our cannon stat blocks so that that you know that hits a certain uh, level of damage, a certain level of difficulty. Um, that shot will be um, more powerful than um, something like uh, like a a, a line shot that that's that's meant to go for a longer distance um but maybe isn't as uh as brutally effective canister shot famously it's it's like turning a, a cannon into a shotgun um it's just uh, pouring a lot of um uh musket balls in uh in, in, into like a metal canister um adds sometimes rocks you know wh- whatever you had um uh at, at, on hand um and then when enemies charge the line uh you just pointed that thing uh you know uh lit the touch hole and prayed that it went off successfully <laughs> um and if it did and if it was aimed properly it could it mow down a whole line of men um and so that you know that's sort of the balancing act there's a little bit of an abstraction and you know i think war game uh buffs may Kind of depending on the persuasion, um, uh, maybe be up in arms or maybe a little sympathetic as to like how we've tried to model that system. Um, but yeah, we we tried to come up with a good balance between usability um, and uh, complexity. And uh, the way that we actually handle attacks for AOE uh, effects is that when you make an artillery attack, it's a new type of attack, um, uh, and it is calculated based on your uh, D20 plus proficiency um, if you are proficient in martial weapons, mm-hmm. plus your intelligence modifier, um, because gunnery was the science of, of geometry and trigonometry uh, at the time. Uh, and so, um, which, which is, is very interesting, right? The type of character who's, who's good with a cannon is not necessarily the type of character, you know, who's, who's like a, a, a very good sniper. No, and, no, because, largely, largely because of the fact that there, you know how I, you know how I did the gag about a bullet with your name on it. <laughs> a um, a grenade a grenade says to whom it may concern, and artillery says, y'all are talking some mad shit for some really fine looking grid coordinates. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's funny. I remember um going to a museum and seeing like uh a- Alexander Hamilton. You know, it was like all of the school books that he had on campaign because you know he was he was going to college at uh Columbia 
um, which I think was then called King's College in New York when the war broke out, right? So he was still kind of trying to get credit for some of the things he was working on, um, you know, his, his law degree. Um, and uh, so he had, he had some law books and he had some artillery manuals. And boy, those, those are some hefty tomes, <laughs> let me tell you. That I would not want to, you know, uh, read in in the middle of, uh, you know, Valley Forge. You'd pro, you'd pro, one, you'd probably not want to read, and two, you'd probably not want to get hit with. Oh, absolutely not. Um, the other, the other, the other, li the other line I could, I could have used was, "Hey, soldier, do you see that man over there?" "Yes, I do, sir." "I don't want to fix that." <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um. Uh. Colonial. Uh, or continental riflemen uh, were were nicknamed widowmakers. It's funny because the word um, it has such a, like a Western connotation today. Um, but that was that was actually a period uh, term by redcoats because uh, they would pick off officers hmm. right uh, from you know uh, a couple hundred yards. And this is because rifles rifles were were rifles. They weren't smooth bore weapons. So mm -hmm. it, it was the the beginning of you know the 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 birth of of what would become a sniper. Right it was really in this sort of period uh, of of colonial warfare from the seventeen sixties seventeen fifty five and onward. Um, and uh, it was it was it was considered very unsportingly and very ungentlemanly uh, to to snipe an enemy officer. But it was it was incredibly effective. Mm -hmm. Now, that bring that brings me to to some to something else, and this this isn't this isn't in the draft that you had sent you had sent me, but it's it's one of those things that's in the back of my mind. Um, now, ov obviously, actually taking part and do and doing and doing and do, and doing um, figure by figure setups of larger scale battles would be would certainly be cumbersome, even for the simplest of games. But has there been has there been given given a thought to abstracting, um, lar larger scale battles, not full on army versus army, but something in something in between? It's that's a really good question. Um, it's something that we are thinking about quite a lot. Um, we we there are a lot of different ways, and there's a lot of different homebrew that does this. That like you know sort of modeling, uh, army based. Uh, clashes um, where a player is either a general and the player is sort of pulling, uh, you know, making command decisions and and uh, uh, against you know what the, the GM controlling the enemy commander, or there's a larger battle happening and the enemy, um, you know, uh, uh, the the player's mission, you know, contributes to that success or failure in in some way. Uh, there's there's a lot of things that we're thinking about um, this. I'll say that that uh, this version of the core rules that we have been working on uh, for Nations and Canons is, is really it's meant to be all of the fundamentals that you need in order to play a game set during the long 18th century. Um, and we definitely have plans to follow this up with a full um, in sort of 18th century source book um, that would have uh, things like a morale system, um, uh, battlefield deployments and, and um, rules for fortifications uh, and and larger scale uh, battles. Uh, like I, it's ideas on, on how uh, a GM might handle large scale battles. That's all longer term stuff, so it, it's it's not present in, in this printing. Mm -hmm. um, but it, we're, we're definitely thinking about that and we're going to be uh, playtesting and honing those systems over the course of the next year or so. Um, but what, the one thing I will say though is that um because players have uh such burst damage at their disposal because you know uh the the firearms are so deadly um gms are encouraged to run uh slightly more challenging encounters than normal right like you should be running uh if you do the math or use the like cobalt fight um uh you should run deadly encounters almost always um uh, and, and also, never ambush your players because they will die in the first round of combat. <laughs> just, just take. Unfortunately, you got to take ambushes out of uh, the GM's playbook because uh, it's just, just not compatible. <laughs> um, but players are able to dish out a tremendous amount of damage, especially if there are artillery pieces. Right? If players can commandeer an artillery piece, mm -hmm. um, players can like effectively counter enemy threats that are that outnumber them in terms of like raw manpower. Right, by uh, five, six times. 
and um, the th this actually works fairly well. Like, you know, the idea of fielding that many monsters in a standard D&D game is uh, kind of onerous. But a lot of our enemies are built using this sort of pseudo war game uh, uh, mechanics, where um, you know the the uh, regular soldier, the footman, um, has an ability that uh, called regimented, um, and that uh, an a sergeant or an officer can command any enemy with the regimented trait to do a volley fire, and so when that happens. Um, we've, it, it happens effectively on the sergeant's turn. The sergeant orders the, the ability. All the other monsters uh, can take the reaction to kind of like close ranks and then uh, um, you know execute the, the volley fire, which is a line. You know, it's it's a, a a line with a width equal to the number of men who are firing of of AOE damage that players have to make a save against because a you know a fusillade of fire is coming their way. Um, and then once you know that, that one sergeant and six uh, redcoats might. Mm -hmm do that um and that takes all of their actions and then on the next round all of those red coats you know if they're unaccosted they're going to take their action just to reload so you can run large scale encounters um you know with with m much larger than a standard um you know uh D, &D uh battle um uh pretty seamlessly from a bookkeeping perspective and also um we designed all of our enemies to be relatively low CR um, because what we didn't want is like, oh, the Dragoon charges you and he's got 100 hit points and he's a bullet sponge and you shoot him you know, uh, 20 times before he finally dies. Um, rather than that, um, you know, encounters should be uh, built around having lots of smaller CR enemies that have these kind of abilities that, that combo. Um, and so the, the, the sergeant can order a volley fire in addition to that, the field officer can improve volley fire, and they also have an ability that lets them uh, effectively order a bayonet charge. So any unit that charges, um, you know, deals uh, a, an additional uh, dice of damage. Um, so you know, if if a footman has uh, taken a shot, thrown away a shot, maybe I, I had to sneak one reference in there. I'm I'm not sorry, um, uh, but you know, the, 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 then the footman you know runs at you with his bayonet. Well, then he's more effective because he's got good leadership, and that leader enemy has a high CR. Um, but it, you know he's not uh, like m making you know big haymakers at the players. He's buffing his his troops. He's got a sort of sphere of influence. Um, cavalry, our, our cavalry enemy, uh, the Hussar, can order a charge, and then any other, uh, you know, unit with the cavalry charge, similarly, can line up and they can, uh, they can charge together. Um, and then whoever they charge down <laughs> has to make a, a, a saving throw uh, or, or suffer the fear condition because cavalry charges of the day were, uh, were absolutely terrifying. Yeah, especially when the winged Hussars arrive. Yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, I, couldn't got, I got that like, reference in there. I <laughs> it was look so look. Sometimes you got to go with the low hanging fruit. <laughs> no, I couldn't. I couldn't write a stat block for Hussar without including uh, a Wing Hussar's reference in the in the the copy <laughs> fluff. So yeah, because um, even even though we're trying even though we're trying to take the set the setting somewhat seriously, we've you got to you got to have a bit you got to have a bit of fun because. Let's face it, the players will be doing dumb shit whenever whenever they can get away with it. Yep, yep. Um, and we have a variant rule, which I, I strongly encourage GMs to run with, which is um, uh, different uses for inspiration. So normally, the like, GM awards inspiration for quality role-playing. Yeah. But I think you know another good one to kind of fit with the battlefield themes right, of a war game is if a player commits an act of bravery or self-sacrifice um, you know, uh, or exposes themselves to danger for the cause... Uh, to give them inspiration, and then they can spend inspiration to achieve the normal effect, um, but also to uh, force a, a shot against them to miss. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple panic buttons that we've built in to like that and into, into some of the rules um, because guns are so deadly. Um, and, and also, you know, the rules uh, explicitly encourage uh, play to start at level two. Um, because at level one, you know, um, a, a stray musket shot can just straight up one shot a player, and that's not that's not fun for anybody. No. And with with that with that kind, with that kind of thing in mind, um, what 
like, I, what are you, what are going to be, what, what are going to be the um, plans for um, nations and cannons going forward? So this version has been in the works for a very long time. Um, it's it's been a passion project, and you know we hit some snags, unfortunately, due to to COVID uh, slowing everybody down. Um, and and since it's been you know something that we've been working on on our own time while we all have our day jobs, it's it's uh, taken a while to get it just right. But I wanted to make sure that we had our grand reveal, um, you know, when all of these rules are balanced and tested, and it feels like a cohesive system. Um, we are actually debuting at uh, Gen Con next month. Um, so from September, I think it is the 15th um, through the uh, 19th, um, we're going to be there. We're going to have a booth. Uh, we're going to be selling uh, hard copies, uh, hot off the presses of our very first print run of the uh, the starter rules. Um, the other thing that's important is that the, the core rules, um, uh, which... Uh, is, is a uh, I think is a 60 page uh, document um, uh, which has all of the uh, the basic uh, material, all of our historical material, um, but not uh, our introductory adventure or the roster of, uh, of like 30 enemies that we've we've created. Um, but those rules are intended to be uh, we want them to be free always um, because a big part of this this project is we want it to be available for for educators and for students um, for anyone you know who uh, wants to run a nation's cannons game for uh, you know for a heritage organization a museum after school program right I think this is this is a perfect ground and and honestly c civics education has never been more important um, and uh, you know as as uh, a designer right like my my design philosophy around all these things is is to is for stealth education right like you you, you lure you lure kids in with um uh with the the fancy uh guns and explosions um and you know uh, then in in the back of their heads right you're also exposing them to uh why uh, people were fighting or you know what the the sort of the more complex issues of uh you know uh, conflicts between um the different political entities that that made up the the army the states and the continental congress or you know um uh the the ways that um um people of color uh or or other disenfranchised groups um or lgbt groups even um did contribute to the war um and have a lot of these interesting stories that then nevertheless kind of get glossed over because they weren't part of ultimately the um you know the the, the groups that um were that laid the foundation for America, right? Um, uh, laid the foundation for an America that uh, was politically led by um, land-owning whites um, up until, you know, really the 19th century. Um, so that's part of our educational mission, is we want this stuff to be available um, uh, online uh, to answer questions um, to, to, and to produce content uh, as far as adventure modules, you know, um, maybe on a... a a tri-monthly basis because uh, we want to work on a campaign that covers uh, the entire breadth of the war from uh, starting with in our very first introductory adventure uh, that's that's in the book right now is uh, covers the invasion of Canada Benedict Arnold's uh, ill-fated uh, quest to conquer our northern neighbor um, before uh, the war even got underway which considering Canada is not part of the United States today uh went about as well as to be expected mm -hmm. um so we, we have a whole uh 17 16 or 17 point uh campaign that we're developing that's gonna uh touch that the, the the entire length of the war and that's gonna be our our primary goal uh is, is putting out that content over the course of the next several years uh, and then also you know doing a full a full book right um this this printing is about 100 pages it's all of the the fundamentals um it's honed it's tested and now we want to expand it you know things like mass combat um additional subclasses to be sure additional research we definitely want that book to be um not necessarily revolutionary war focused but to be role playing in the 18th century right mm -hmm. um you want to do napoleon you want to do um uh, you know the the Seven Years' War. You want for some godforsaken reason to have merry adventures during the War of Jenkins' Ear. Go right ahead. Um, you know, here are all the tools you need to do that. Um, and uh, uh, to 
to kind of flesh out uh, that stuff. We have ideas for things like incorporating monk and artificer, which can work in a mundane setting, but with a lot of custom hacks. Um, and so that requires quite a bit of, uh, of additional work to, to make sure that they make sense and, and they, they fit the setting um, without it becoming too steampunky um, or too wirefighty uh, also. Um, so that is going to be our agenda over the course of the next year or so. Um, but in the meantime, you know, anybody can uh, go to nationsandcanons.com um, there are, our rules are available for download for free, uh, where we also have character sheets, um, and a sort of a quick start primer, um, and all of the characters that we feature to discuss the, the role system that we've created. They're all real characters from history, right? And it's a diverse set. Um, we did our, our best to find, um, you know, as, as many different people of different cultures, um, and, and women, you know, on the battlefield, some of them, uh, just, just walking around brazenly, uh, Possibly apocryphal, possibly folk heroes, but you know, uh, some of them, you know, in in disguise, which is its own kind of neat uh, uh, role playing aspect, and uh, and and that stuff is is uh, all available. And you know, we just encourage any uh, educator or, or history teacher who who wants to use it to mm -hmm. dig in. Now, I will, and I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how that um, how that how that comes about how that comes about since there's. There's a f there there are there are a few ang there are a few angles that I that I like to do especially when it comes to the that um un that untamed almost almost frontiersman um approach because um to to quote seventeen seventy six not everybody's from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No. Uh. We we definitely have uh. Uh, some ideas in the way long term, but maybe you know, doing a Lewis and Clark, a couple of Lewis and Clark adventures uh, uh, you could, down you, you could probably you could probably do a one shot horror story of just of just um of just of just surviving just surviving the night after the in after the infamous um after the inf after the infamous last day of George Washington's presidency. Oh boy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how true that story is, but given the amount of alcohol that. W that supposedly was involved. I'd like to think that there's some truth in it. I think it was like 30 kegs or something. They they have like they have the receipt uh, actually because the tavern it's it's Francis Tavern in in New York City right in in Lower Manhattan. It's still around. It's a kind of a museum bar uh, and and like they, they got the documents. So um, maybe someone uh, someone uh, ginned up those docs. But if not, boy, that was a lot of alcohol. Suppose supposedly, if you convert it to today's money, it would be about it, the bar tab was seventeen point two thousand dollars. <laughs> um, and as far as far as as far as what as far as what was on the thing. Um, and I've told this story in the past, but it's all, but it gets, but it never ceases being funny. Okay. 54 bottles of Madeira wine, 60 bottles of Bordeaux wine, 8 bottles of Old Stock whiskey, 22 bottles of Porter Ale, 8 bottles of Hard Cider, 12 jugs of beer, and 7, lar seven large bowls of punch. And that was Washington's party. The staff and musicians also had 16 bottles of Bordeaux wine, five bottles of Madeira wine, and seven bowls of punch, as well as damages for many broken glasses, which equaled about $300 worth of reimbursements. The final, the final bill at the time was 80 not was 89 pounds and four shillings, or in or um 17.2 thousand dollars. So you know, old, old George sure knew how to party. <laughs> to be to be fair to to be fair, um, given the fact that you had a lot of very rough people, I mean, there's there's the fact that um, there's the fact that Adams had a long and illustrious history of managing to piss off everyone, including his own colleagues. Um, mm -hmm. Jeff, Je I believe Jefferson bringing it, bringing in somebody for negotiations with the with the French simply because, as much as he, simply because he hated the French just as much as he hated the British, he just hated the French slightly less. Um, and the, and the and the fact that, and the fact that um no, that nothing could get um nothing could get Ben Franklin's attention more than boozing and whoring. Uh, yeah, old, old Ben, um, 
<laughs> uh, he, he specifically wore his beaver skin cap because that was all the rage among the sort of frontiersmen stories. He wore that to uh, to fancy French salons where he knew that it would uh, impress the um, uh, well ladies of the night um, among uh, you know his uh, uh, more noble hosts mm-hmm. and uh, uh, ran up quite a tab himself for his diplomatic efforts, which were what uh, won the war ultimately. So you know what? Uh, if if funding Ben Franklin's lavish party lifestyle is uh, is what ultimately the straw that broke the British back, uh, I I say go for it. Mm-hmm. Oh. But with all with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And there's certainly no shortage of that. <laughs> no, it's it's been my pleasure. This has been a lot of fun, and um, uh, you know, I <laughs> I, I like to talk uh, about um, talk shop about uh, the mechanics and like how we uh, we wound up in some of the places we did because there were some twisty, twisty, torturous roads uh, that ultimately led us to some of the design decisions we made. But um, I think it it it's led to a you know a, a system and kind of a product that. Um, has a very different feel from a lot of uh, of baseline five E, you know, and, and that feels that feels cool, right? Being able to take something that people know and love, and then uh, translate it into something completely different um, that then that still shares some of the core essence of it um, that can be used to explore history and and totally unrelated stuff. Mm-hmm. And and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>